Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. Hello to Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello, hello. I'm Yay. surprised we have nautical fans. <laughs> and Andrew Walker is joining us once again. Once again. Andrew, don't touch that dial. <laughs> there we go. Touch that dial. Uh, so that's going to be our theme today. Now, um, uh, there are some, there are some stories, uh, from our past episodes that could be the topic of today's episode where we're going to focus on murders and crimes and scandals connected to television, uh, the television industry and, uh, celebrities who gained fame on television. Um, and like I said, on past episodes, there are a number of uh, topics that we covered that could fall under this category. Uh, one that immediately comes to mind is Phil Hartman, who uh, ah. died to murder suicide with his wife Bryn in 1998. Tragic story. One of the more shocking celebrity deaths when I learned about it because yeah. I just never saw this coming. Um, Carl Schweitzer, who we've talked about, uh, even though. Carl played Alfalfa in the the Little Rascals or Our Gang shorts in theaters. We kind of all grew up with the Little Rascals on television, so I kind of consider him a television star. Uh, And uh, as we covered on our podcast before, he was shot by Bud Stilts over a fifty dollar debt back in nineteen fifty nine. Where where did he get shot again? Uh, In the in the groin. Is that how they described it? Yeah. And, you know, something I just learned today, and I don't know the details of this, but apparently there was a contestant named Christina Grimmy, who was a contestant on The Voice, and I did not know this. She was killed by an obsessed fan in 2016 while signing autographs in Florida. Have you guys heard that story? I did not. Yeah. Yeah, this is new to me. I'm going to have to look into that. Terrible. And... Another name that comes up, even though maybe a lot of people might not associate her with television, but uh, Sharon Tate got her start on TV. And uh, one of the shows that she made an appearance on was, uh, of all things, the Beverly Hillbillies. Ah. Uh, Here's a little clip. Howdy. Well, howdy to you. You're Jethro, aren't you? Uh, Yes, ma'am. You hear any music? (laughs) No, should I? Well, yeah. I should, too, but I don't, darn it. Well, if you'll wait, I'll hum something for you. <laughs> what do you say, Chief? Oh, Jeffro, how nice to see you. Oh, howdy, Miss Jane. <laughs> something wrong? Oh, no, just listening for music. <laughs> what kind of music? What music? Hope music. <laughs> Try me again, Jeffro. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to speak to you in the pool. Pool? The secretarial pool. Let's go. <laughs> I shall return, Jethro. <laughs> ah, Miss Hathaway. So, yeah, Sharon Tate, not only did she appear uh, on the Beverly Hillbillies, she was on Mr. Ed, uh, the man from Uncle, and then did several movies, including one with Dean Martin in his Matt Helm uh, franchise that he did. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that when you see her in these clips, she's, she's young and vibrant. In this particular clip that I played from uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, she had a brunette wig on, so she's hardly recognizable in it. Um, but it's just, it's sad, like, when you see her in these clips and, and realize the potential that she had and that was all taken away due to the circumstances that we've touched on this podcast before right. with the Manson family and all that. Um, so those are a couple of names that uh, that came up as I was doing my research, but the one story that really inspired this entire episode uh, is one of the most famous celebrity murders uh, of all time. Uh, Bob Crane, the murder of Bob Crane, the star of Hogan's Heroes, um, a show that I grew up with in syndication. uh, And it was great. It was a great show. Laugh out loud, funny. They, they took what could have been, you know, a controversial topic of, Nazi Germany and turned it into a laugh out loud comedy. And a lot of that had to do with the, the charm and charisma of Bob Crane. 
Uh, he started out as a, a DJ when he came out to L.A. And, and gained notoriety doing that. And then that got parlayed into an acting career in various things. But the role that made him a star was was uh, Colonel Hogan and Hogan's Heroes. And great um, What's that? A great role. Yeah, yeah. Just funny and a great cast and everything. And and so that's how the public saw him. That's uh, That was the persona that people associated with, with uh, Bob Crane. Um, but when Hogan's Heroes went off the air, he took whatever roles he can find uh, to make ends meet and ended up in a, a play, a dinner theater production called Beginner's Luck. And uh, it was playing in Scottsdale, or Arizona. So he had an apartment there in Scottsdale, Arizona um, while he was on tour. And a friend opened the door and came in and found him bludgeoned the dead death in his bed. It was just a bloody, ugly mess. And, you know, the, the immediate reaction is who could do this to this beloved actor? What the hell did he do to deserve that? And as the authorities were investigating the crime and examining the evidence, they found, uh, a, Oh gosh, a studio of equipment and recording devices. And as they started looking at tapes and stuff, found out that Bob Crane had a tendency of recording his sexual escapades. Um, his son tried to defend, uh, this, this, uh, habit by saying, well, all the, the women in the videos uh, knew what they were doing. Uh, but no, that wasn't necessarily the case. A lot of women came forward after it was revealed to the public and said, I never consented to being recorded yeah, in this which situation. Yeah, is a crime in California because that's one of those states where you have to let the other party know that they're being recorded. But yeah. I don't know if that merits being bludgeoned. <laughs> well. well, there's a reason. Well, Okay, and this is where we're going to yeah. get into speculation. Right. So, so there was a guy who I, I believe sold the video equipment uh, to Bob Crane, and I, a lot of people came to him for his expertise when it came to video equipment and, and servicing and repairs and knowing which qu equipment to use. And that led into a friendship with Bob Crane. And this guy's name was John Henry Carpenter. Uh, it says here he's a regional sales manager for Sony Electronics who often help famous clients with their video equipment. Uh, they struck up a friendship, uh, go to bars together, nightclubs together. And they, now I don't know if they would both be with a woman at the same time, but Carpenter sort of glommed on to Bob Crane's charm and fame and really loved being part of that world. So they uh, sort of uh, empowered each other and encouraged each other to do this. Well, there was some talk that maybe even as late as the night before the murders, Bob Crane had uh, confided in friends that he was getting tired of this hanger on and decided he was going to uh, separate and say, look, I don't want you in my life anymore. Maybe he blamed him for this or what the deal was. But the story is, is that he wanted to separate the friendship and the friendship with this carpenter guy. So some of the evidence of the crime scene was there was no sign of force entry. Nothing was stolen. Um, all the tapes and equipment and everything was there. And investigators speculate that he was bludgeoned with a tripod, uh, even though that that's speculation. They never did find the murder weapon. Yeah. Um, and so eventually they charged Carpenter with this murder. Now, at the time, some of the evidence that they discovered was bloody bits of something inside Carpenter's car. And uh, they took samples, but DNA evidence didn't exist at the time. Oh, but they did run a test on the blood samples that they found in the car, and they matched Bob Crane's blood type. Uh, but they, they couldn't go any further than that because DNA testing didn't exist. Um, but the fact that Bob Crane's blood type, which was not Carpenter's blood type, and no one else was in Carpenter's car that could have left a blood sample in the car. You got to think, okay, this guy, maybe, maybe Crane was trying to end the friendship. He enjoyed that world too much and out of rage 
took Bob Crane out, and there was there's circumstantial evidence there to put him away, but eventually the guy was acquitted. Oh, re- <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Surprise, surprise. That that will tie into when I when we get, get to my topic. But my God, so let me get this straight. In the backseat of your car, we found blood. Is that is that normal? Like right. you normally mm-hmm. find blood in the back of your. Frank, what are you doing with blood in the back of your car? I, I, I can't explain it. <laughs> well, this is going to raise questions, Frank. Is yeah. it your blood? No. Then it's really going to raise some questions, Frank. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how the defense attorneys were able to get that seed of doubt out of the uh, – or plant that seed of doubt with the jury and say, oh, that blood is irrelevant. I mean, What year was this again, Joe? Uh, he was murdered in 78, yeah, uh, June fits. 78. I, um, I wonder if the conversation veered into something where um, Crane said, you know, buddy, I, you know, we got to end this, you know, and if you don't step away, I'm, I'm going to, you know, reveal, I'm going to leak something. Yeah. I, I but wonder, you would think but, Crane had but, more to lose but, than uh, Carpenter. Now that I but, say that, I was going to, I was yeah. Thinking, yeah. yeah, he would be telling like, on himself. Like, dude, you're Hogan. But uh, I, what, what was it? Was it the fear of losing that friendship and that access? Yeah, and enough to motivate a murder. I well, don't know. not for a normal person, <laughs> right. but you know, a psychopath maybe. Ah. But I mean, if they investigated the guy and they found that Crane was paying for his house, paying his rent, paying his utilities, sure, then you could probably say, you know what, when we're seeing a financial connection here, but did the guy have, you know, randomly large sums of money deposited in his, in his account, and then it so it happened to match the amount that's missing from Crane's account. Yep. Yeah. And so years later, in 1990, they tried to test those samples that they had collected for DNA. But, you know, we're talking, you know, a decade or more later, and uh, it, it was all just inconclusive. So didn't necessarily rule him out. Uh, he eventually, uh, this carpenter guy eventually passed away in 1990. Uh, when, when did he pass away? He was, he was arrested and charged in 92 for the murder uh, hoping that they would be able to use this DNA evidence, but no, nothing came of that. Um, it says at the 1994 trial, so it's two years after he'd been arrested, um, Crane's son, Robert, testified that Crane had repeatedly expressed a desire to sever his friendship with Carpenter in the weeks before his death. He said that Carpenter had become a hanger-on and a nuisance to the point of becoming obnoxious. Uh, my dad expressed that he just didn't need Carpenter uh, hanging around him anymore. And uh, Robert testified that Crane had called Carpenter the night before the murder and ended their friendship. So, yeah, it, it's looking pretty bad. It it, it bothers me that uh, this guy got away with it. Um, and then he went on to direct Halloween, John Carpenter, right? <laughs> He's the wrong guy, the other guy. Dang it, Andrew. <laughs> no, no, no. No association that we. Yeah, so uh, it, it's it's a shame we, we lost such a talented individual, and, and it's shocking that such a dark side was revealed, that this guy had demons. Uh, today we might call it a sex addiction, yeah. um, but that's probably why this story has, has kind of stayed in the public eye for so long is, you know, not only is there this unsolved murder mystery, but the fact that this beloved charismatic popular hollywood actor had this shocking sex uh, addiction side um just kind of adds uh to the to the allure of this this story and and they did try to turn it into a movie it was called uh, autofocus where uh greg kinnear who used to be on talk soup uh plays bob crane um and I, I never saw the movie, so I don't know if they drew any conclusions or pointed any fingers at anybody in that movie. I might have to check that out. Um, but yeah, t- in my opinion, everything points to this Carpenter guy, and yes. I think he got away with murder. And there were no other suspects. There were no. There was. There well, was, I mean, did he uh, even have an alibi? Yeah, I, I was going to say, like, was well, there any other? Well, options? here's here's what the the defense attorneys did, and this is probably what got their client uh off is they're saying that with the nature of these sex tapes that he had there could have been any number of angry husbands vengeful victims 
uh, that he probably had an enemies list, and that was probably enough to plant the seed of doubt. You know, uh, now, now when you say it like that, it, if any one of them was the daughter or wife of a Hollywood executive, mm-hmm. one of the studio guys, and they sent a fixer in. Yeah. Yeah. But you would think, though, that the tapes would have gone missing. You know, like right. if, if you're going to send someone to silence Bob Crane, then aren't you, you going to load a duffel bag full of tapes? Or maybe some were missing. I don't know. But uh, the police sure found uh, stacks and stacks and stacks of tapes. So if if they were silencing them, somebody screwed up and left the tapes behind. So Joe, did you, did you read about what his son did uh, trying to profit off of that? No, no. What happened? It says that in June of 2001, his son, Scotty, launched a website, bobcrane.com. It included a paid section section featuring photographs and outtakes from his father's sex films. Whoa. Oh, no. What? Oh, That's wow. pretty exploitative yeah, for, that for is, a, that is, a son to do, don't you that, think? I mean, are you just trying to salt the memory of your dad's grave? I mean, what are you doing here? Uh, <laughs> that's brutal. Yeah, that seems... The, the X-rated photographs and videos from <laughs> Crane's private archive of liaisons involving him and various other women could be purchased for a monthly subscription for 1995. Wow. <laughs> you know what? Those Hogan, those Hogan's Heroes residuals are not what they used to be. I guess, man. Of that. And oh, that's not something I need in my brain. That's not something I would want to <laughs> sit down and watch. No. Uh, no, no. Wow. That's, I did not know that. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's messed up. Wow. We did not help the case there. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, You're trying to paint this guy as the guy who might have, you know, allegedly murdered Bob Crane as a the problem here. And then you're like, well, it's bad enough that Bob Crane was doing taking those. Now then his son's like, yeah, you know what? You can add a cherry on top of on top of this crap Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that boy, that's that's offensive. Yeah, I know. Um, pretty crazy. Uh, so there's another story that I want to talk about. Another pretty famous one. You guys may be familiar with the story of Rebecca Schaefer. Do you guys know the name Rebecca Schaefer? The name sounds familiar, but I will fall on my sword and say I am not familiar with this. <laughs> <laughs> only 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 because of uh you you mentioned her, so I had to look her up pre show, Joe. Yeah. But a, a very uh unfortunate incident of stalking. Yeah, exactly. And uh her fate uh, led to Changes in laws, the creation of laws, anti-stalking laws, and yeah. what kind of information uh, people can get access to to reveal where somebody lives. Yep. And uh, so Rebecca Schaefer, she was a, a model uh, slash actress who moved out to L.A., got some minor uh, acting roles before she landed the role of Patricia Russell in a show called My Sister Sam. Uh, the, the show was noticeable or notable because it also co-starred Pam Dauber who had gained fame on Mork and Mindy. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was initially a a pretty big hit in its first season, but for whatever reason, uh, numbers fell off sharply in its second season and, and ended up getting canceled. Um, and she might be a, uh, a name that has been forgotten since then. Uh, but due to her tragic outcome, uh, it's, it's a name that comes up when you talk about, uh, Hollywood murders and scandals and crimes, uh, in, uh, July of 1989, a 19 year old fan named Robert John Bardo, uh, shot and killed her at her home in West Hollywood. And apparently he had been stalking her for three years prior and he kind of kind of lost interest in her and started getting obsessed with other female celebrities at so the time. So he started as a 16-year-old stalker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, and he really uh, a bitch. apparently his brother got him a firearm, which... Uh, that actually kind of tracks me with today's rules. I yeah, mean. yeah. It, I mean, the guy clearly have had to have had mental issues and his brother's like, well, here's a gun for you. And he, he also, uh, hired a, a, a private detective. Yeah. So we're going to get to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. want to jump the gun too <laughs> yeah, far. Yeah. Hey, but, slow uh, down sorry, there. But, uh, yeah. This yeah. Guy, so, uh, <laughs> like I said, he had, uh, turned his obsession toward, uh, Tiffany, Debbie Gibson and Madonna. 
But while watching a movie called uh, Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills, which uh, also starred Schaefer, uh, Bardo was outraged when she appeared in bed uh, in a scene with an actor and uh, was jealous of uh, her character being in bed and uh, called her all kinds of names and said that she is going to have to pay a price. So I, apparently he had made several trips to L.A. trying to find her. And this is, man, this is so sick and twisted. So he was motivated uh, by the murder of Teresa Saldana in 1982 and found out that her murderer, her stalker, had used a private investigator to get Saldana's uh, address. So he goes out to L.A., this Bardo does, uh, finds a detective, pays him $250. Oh, this was in Tucson. Uh, he paid the uh, detective $250, and the detective provided him with Schaefer's home address thanks to California's Department of Motor Vehicles records. Uh, his brother, as I said, helped him get a three fifty seven handgun. Uh, Bardo travels to Los Angeles. Uh, this was his third trip. He wandered through the neighborhood uh, where the address was, asked neighbors if uh, she actually lived there, and once he confirmed that the address was correct, uh, knocked on her door, rang the doorbell. Schaefer was expecting a uh, script. Uh, she was going to audition for The Godfather Part Three, And so she was expecting a script. So when there was a knock on the door, she thought it was the script being delivered. She opened it, and there was Bardo standing there. And he had a letter... Uh, and an autograph that she had, she had responded to a fan letter from him, which now is a no-no. A lot of celebrities do not respond to fan mail sure. because of this. Thanks for ruining it, Bardo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so he presents this letter and uh, autograph to her, and she she chatted with him briefly, but she must have got a bad vibe because she said, "Please don't." come here again. Uh, he went to a nearby diner, had breakfast, returned to her apartment an hour later, knocked on the door. Uh, she answered the door. He says, Bardo himself said she had a cold look on her face. So I'm sure she was angry that he was returning back and knocking on her door. And he pulled out the handgun and shot her in the chest at point blank range, uh, in the doorway of her apartment. Her last Word was why as she fell to the ground. Um, she was rushed to the emergency room of Cedar sinai Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead 30 minutes after her arrival. Um, Bardo and, said all this to the police after he was arrested, like what he said to the TV? I believe there's a video interview with him that you could probably look up on YouTube that's where how, he, I mean, that's he how describes details, yeah. everything that happened. What he yeah. saw on the TV that provoked him. And I, I, what I yelled at the TV because I was like, you can't do that. And then... Yeah. She says, wow. Yeah. Yeah, he pretty much admitted all that. This is 1989, right? Yeah. So we've done the post-apocalyptic stuff. So there should be PSAs about late. For Madonna, you could be like, buddy, get in line if you want to stalk her. Yeah. 1989 fame. Yeah, exactly. But um, good God. She opened yeah. the door a second time, a peephole. You look through the, <laughs> you you saw this guy once yeah. and you're like, oh, wow. It's, she she, she like, was only 21. Yeah, and uh, you know, and there's there's a Ladies. chain of events there. You know, I, I use this analogy where if you remove the link, uh, any of the link in this chain of events, she'd still be alive. Yeah. But so many things went wrong from this private detective giving him her address to her answering the door to her responding to his fan mail. All this stuff the contributed. PI. Uh, You're not going to, especially when you said about, mentioned a 1982 case that where someone used a PI to murder. Yeah. At, yeah, the Teresa Saldana So you think the case, 1989 yeah. PI guy's like, you're not going to, how old are you? 18, yeah. 19? Yeah. You're not going to do anything weird with this, are you? Yeah. <laughs> this, with this 21-year-old woman that I'm tracking down for you? This, you, act, this well known, adjusted, known you, actress. Yeah, this I'm known actress. You, you well-adjusted, apparently, 19-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, a uh, uh, buck's a buck, I guess. Good God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, that's what assassins say, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, a man's got to eat. It's just a job. That's right. Oh, my God. Um, obviously, he left the scene of the crime, and then witnesses said there was a man running through traffic on the 10, as they say in L.A. Um, he was arrested and basically confessed to uh, everything. And um, so it, as a result of this, um, 
federal law regarding the release of personal information through the DMV was changed. There's the Drivers Privacy Protection Act, um, which prevents the DMV from releasing private addresses. Uh, it was enacted in 94. I think if someone wants to get your address, they're probably going to get it one way right. or another. Wasn't there the um, phone book? The yellow page or the white pages? Well, I can't, Im- I can't imagine she would have been listed in right. the phone book, yeah. but so, it's possible that they were. And so there you go. If if someone says, I don't want to be listed in the phone book, that <laughs> this is where, you know, you, you talk about government protocols. People, if they don't want to be listed in the phone book, there's a reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't just give up that information. I'm looking for my brother. Can you prove that's your brother? <laughs> Yeah. Now, like I said, I, I had something happen to me personally, and, and this is just kind of speculation on my part, but I was a victim of road rage. I, um, I was creeping on a light and a guy accelerated to beat a yellow light and almost hit me as he went through the uh, intersection. And we ended up pulling up side by side at a red light. And he, I could see him just screaming at me from the driver's side window and and they tell you to ignore these people just don't acknowledge don't engage right, right. so the light goes green i'm driving this guy's trying to keep up with me i see him screaming and screaming and screaming from the driver's side window and the the less i engaged him the more enraged he got and at one point he slowed down and pulled up behind me and i remember thinking is he writing down my driver's license or my my license, license plate? plate yeah and I'm like, well, I don't know what that would do if he were. Well, less than a week later, my car was vandalized at my my apartment complex. So oh, yeah. I suspect that if you have a friend at the Secretary of State, there's probably ways to get somebody's information if you have a driver or, or a license plate number. Now, again, that's speculation on my point or on my part. Someone might tell me, oh, no, no, that's not possible, but. It's kind of a the weird coincidence is, that, yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah. guy was screaming and screaming and screaming at me, and then my car got vandalized. So Was it Michael Douglas from Falling Down? <laughs> no, he's a hero of mine. That, oh. that movie was great. <laughs> I love that movie. Oh, that movie um, you saw. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, what was the other one? Uh, Death Wish, Charles Bronson's <laughs> Death Wish. So. Um, but, yeah, just a, a footnote on the Rebecca Schaefer thing. In, in addition to these uh, these new laws that were enacted uh her death also helped prompt the 1990 passing of america's first anti-stalking laws which can now be used against people so anti-stalking um, in 1990 and you've had hollywood fame since the 40s where you yeah. had you know, whatever version of paparazzi that existed for decades to just plain old stalking yeah mm. now you know when you hear stories like this this is where i try to give uh, the benefit of doubt to celebrities who are assholes. You know, people say, oh, you, you, that guy was a dick, blah, 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 blah. You have to imagine right. what they deal with on a daily basis. You may have heard about David Letterman had a woman repeatedly break into his house. Yes. Um, and you have to get a restraining order. And the restraining order doesn't mean anything to these people. They right. keep doing it. Yep. Um, I heard, personally, I heard a story um, about Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees group that uh, he had a, a fan that was so obsessive that when a home became uh, went up for sale across the street from his home, his obsessed fan bought the home so she could be close to him. Wow. And then his dog disappeared is what I was told. That's called and dedication, so, folks. So, <laughs> oh so imagine when you encounter a celebrity and they're a little standoffish, uh, take into consideration that they have to deal with this stuff. Um uh, again, this is me uh, name dropping again, but uh, when I was in L.A. in 2015, I had found out that Will Ferrell uh, was shooting an episode of Drunk History at this location in, in L.A. Okay. And there was a website that gave out that information. So I showed up and I <laughs> roll up to this building and they had security and everything. And the the security guard <laughs> who obviously wasn't doing his job. I said, Hey, what's, what's going on here today? And he goes, Oh, they're shooting a episode of drunk history. And I said, who's on, who's on set today? And he goes, Will Ferrell. And I'm thinking, should you be telling me this? You're a security guard. You're telling me who's on site. So I kind of hung out. It was drizzling a little bit. Eventually they wrapped up vehicles were leaving and this white van pulled up right in front of me. And I see this curly head of hair 
looking away from me. And then he turns and looks right at me. It was Will Ferrell. And I, I played it cool. I didn't want to do anything to make him think that he was in danger. Yeah. My phone was in my pocket because it was drizzling. So all I can do was give him a friendly wave. And he kind of gave a friendly wave back. And then I'm thinking, what do I do? Do I knock on the glass, you know, pull out the phone or whatever? And I'm like, I don't want to scare this man. I don't want him to think that I'm there to end his career, you know? And so I just was satisfied with the friendly wave. He ended up driving off. Right. And, and it still that's how a normal person. It still serves yes, as a yes. good story because yeah. look, unless you're going to be in the picture, do you need another picture of Will Ferrell? You can get that from any tabloid site. Right. You can watch that's any right. movie. Unless, like, why would I say, like, look what's on my phone? Yeah, yeah. A picture of Will Ferrell, I'm like, oh, wow, that's kind of creepy. Yeah. So I try to take into consideration that these people have had run-ins right. with nut jobs. And I take what I can get. If it's a friendly wave, great. If he would have rolled down the window and said, hey, how's it going? That would have been awesome. But I wasn't going to make him feel like he was in any danger. So. Right, right. Uh, and like I said, that's that's how a normal person and reacts. you know what? I, I'm not going to defend everything uh, because I don't know him personally, obviously. But take Tom Cruise, for instance. Mm-hmm. People have written a lot about him, said a lot about him. At one of the premieres, he, he came up, and I think people have seen this on, online. He came to give an interview at, at, along the, the line on the red carpet, and someone sprayed him with a with a prank flower. Oh, I remember that. And yeah. then he asked the gentleman, like, why would you do that? Yeah. And people are going like, oh, Tom, we're, we're actually giving Tom Cruise crap about it because this guy thinks he's all mighty. That could have been acid for all you know. You don't oh, know yeah. what kind of crazy person spraying him with like a neurotoxin or, you know, I mean, just, so at that point, you know, you, you so you take instance like that or you go like Tom yeah. Cruise, despite whatever ex- eccentricities people say, you know, yeah, when you, when you live in a, almost like a fishbowl, you know, the, most of us don't have people trying to like, hey, look, it's Nick's dirty sock. I, I'm going to cherish this. <laughs> wow. Well, speak for yourself. Um, <laughs> I, but, you know, that brings up that Christina Grim- Grimmie that I brought right. up earlier from The Voice. She was signing autographs. Like, it's so so innocent and mundane, and she lost her life signing autographs. It's You, you, you can't help but think our celebrities can be like, all right, that's it. I'm not signing autographs anymore. Like, that will put somebody in jeopardy. So, it's scary. You know, I, I, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum of you, Joe. I, I haven't really met anybody that I would consider famous. But I thought about it, like if I did, and I and I thought my initial reaction would be, "Oh, cool, can I get a picture with you?" But these days, I'm sure celebrities would get that a lot, and it's like, okay, I have maybe a couple seconds with this person. I'm just going to tell them what I like about them specifically, yeah, and tell them just, "Hey, keep rocking." One of my favorite stories I heard was a, a friend of mine who has moved out to L.A. and works in L.A. He was at a little pub or something that he enjoyed going to, and he saw a camera crew arrive. And in walked Jerry Seinfeld and he freaked out was like, Oh my God, that's Jerry Seinfeld. And so he, he kept getting, you know, more drinks just to kind of stall, try to see how things were unfolding. He watched the production that was going on. He kept lingering and lingering for hours, got late and the crew started wrapping up and he saw Jerry Seinfeld, uh, leave the, the pub and start walking out to his car. So my buddy, followed him out to his car and was like, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan, blah, 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 blah. And as Jerry approached his car, he's like, can I get a photo with you? And Jerry climbed into his car, turned to him and said, no, I'm good. And drove (laughs) off. And I'm like, that is so Jerry. Like, that's like a scene from Seinfeld. No, I'm good. But can you blame him? This guy's following you to your car. It's dark out. It's not, not the what. Maybe not the wisest choice, but yeah. But I mean, at the same time, I can understand like, oh, that it's would, Jerry. It would, that would be exciting. Yeah, but but you don't know what's coming at you. You don't, you don't know this guy. You don't. So <laughs> no, it's it's yeah, it's a crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to give the, you have to give celebrities a kind of a a long runway. Yeah, when it comes to stuff like and that. And if they decline, uh an encounter you have to respect that you don't yeah. get mad um again here's me name dropping again just uh, a year or so ago i was at the hollywood sign and uh ran into patrick stewart and he was out of breath he was sweating he was going uphill it was hot and uh, i recognized him and i said hi and he turned and he he was polite to me and when i said can i get a photo or something he looked around at the hundreds of people in the park that were also there to see the hollywood sign and he and he whispers to me 
can we not? Because there are a lot of people around here. And I said, I get it. I understand. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I left. Oh. But think of the number of people who were like, you're an a-hole. Like, come on, how, how much time would it take to get a photograph? Right. But no, what a mature man, response, Joe. He's going to get mobbed. If yeah. so, that's Patrick Stewart. I mean, here's, here's, in my opinion, one of the biggest stars on the planet right now at the Hollywood sign, like a common tourist like me. So you got to respect their wishes. You yeah. got to be cool, man. I just yep. want to tell our audience, uh, these are the type of stories where initially the alternate title for this show is going to be A Cup of Joe with Joe. Because <laughs> you get these stories and you're like, yeah. This is me name dropping. There it is. There we go. Can we, can can we hear it again? Video. I didn't hear it. So I ran into Patrick Stewart at the Hollywood <laughs> sign. <laughs> and, Why does uh, that sound like a yeah. body thumping? <laughs> <show? That's laughs> very... I mean, I know we're doing a Hollywood crime scene, but why did it have to sound Don't like a read body thumping? into yeah. it, man. <laughs> and then Will it's Ferrell drove out. <laughs> so those are right. like mafia hits. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a sack. All right, let's uh, let's move on to our next topic. So uh, imagine those Pete. What did you bring to the table today? Well, you know this sunshine topic that we're going on. <laughs> I ended up covering basically game shows that featured killers on them, and I thought. This can't be that big of a topic. I, I'll be lucky to find one example. As usual, I'm wrong. And the first example that I found, not the most prominent example, the first example that uh, uh, caught my attention was the one of uh, Paul Curry. And this was a gentleman who was a twice, a two-time Jeopardy champion. A champion. And of allegedly a member of Mensa. So the man is smart, or like wow. they come across as smart. And... He ended up marrying a, a, a woman named Linda, and they lived in California. Uh, they met at a nuclear power plant where she was the secretary before she, nice. worked her way, she worked her way up into administration. She was about 12 years his senior. Hmm. And she's, from what her friends say, she's uh, when she commits to a relationship, she commits. She, but she's had several relationships, so obviously things may not have worked out or in the course of time. She meets Paul. She's smitten with him. This man, I don't know what he, apparently people said that he would dote over her, you know, so you'd lavish her with attention and praise and, you know, I guess, you know, some, some charms work. So they meet in 1989, they get married not soon, not too long after. And she already has several life insurance policies and she has, she, she's done well for herself. Not long after getting married, he insists that she take out a million dollar life insurance policy. Red flag. Thank you. There are several of these <laughs> as this goes on because obviously she introduces Paul to her friends and you know people are like oh let me meet this man who might end up spending your list and they're like wow this guy sounds intelligent but he's a cheap suit he is not intelligent and there's some there's a creepy vibe about him because he's always talking about money and it's 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 he's giving off the wrong vibe and what. What Linda starts sharing information with them is like, yeah, you know, he's been married before. He lied about it, but, you know, I still love him, and he's still... <sighs> but he insists that, you know, I, I name him the sole beneficiary. In fact, the existing life insurance policies that I already have <laughs> that I should name him. And they're going, what is... No, don't do that. Her ex... or One of her ex-boyfriends, uh, I, I believe, or maybe her, her... Yeah, an ex-boyfriend, who was a life insurance agent, would come up and say... Linda, I'm in the business. That's a red flag. Don't do it. And they're like, she's like, well, maybe I'll name you. He goes, no, definitely don't name me. Name your sister. <laughs> yeah. Put your sister's yeah, name on member, it. Yeah. That's, that makes the most logical sense. And don't stay with this man. Because they would say, well, it's weird because it didn't seem like he was with her for the sex. It, it was not a lot of passion in the marriage. But even though he would do all the other things outside of sex to be with her. Hmm. And she started getting sick. A few uh -oh. months after they got married, and she would, you know, they take her to the hospital because, she, you know, she was like, I have a lot of GI problems. Doctors can't figure out what's going on. They're doing all these tests on her. If, even to the point where when they can't figure out what's physically wrong with you, this is kind of an, an indictment on the, on the medical field, they start automatically assuming it's psychological. Mm. Munchausen syndrome, they say yeah. that. Or, you know, they're like, yeah. oh, you know, she's kind of looking for attention. Maybe she needs it. Maybe she's just imagining stuff's happening. Mm. 
and they don't look they don't they don't do a thorough enough check because what it ended up happening well, well run a blood test or they, something they, anything but here's the thing with, with a blood test they don't know what they're looking for mm. they're looking for the usual suspects yeah. unfortunately you but that means there is something when you're poisoned your body has reaction to it mm-hmm. so there is something there so she ends up being discharged from the hospital when she was in the hospital he would visit her and one nurse at one time says, I thought there was something cloudy in the IV bag going to her. Oh, no. Ooh. And she would report that and said, you know, he would he was coming out of the room kind of like in a hurry. And so the nurse is like, "This, these are all red, red flags. Yeah. They still, the cops come by and say, you know, you're, are you sure everything is okay? Because other people are calling the cops for her, mm-hmm. saying, Linda, you got to talk to someone. This is not right. And she goes, no, well... You know, the only other person it could be is maybe Paul because he lives with me all the time. But his DNA, of course, will be all over the house. There's nothing to prove it, you know, what's going on. She gets discharged. She still goes back to him. They live in the house in um, uh, San Palma or something. I, I, I forgot the, the exact name, but a house in her name. After she goes back to living with him, when her, her sister and friends were saying, hey, you're going to leave, right? She goes, yeah, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. She calls them after moving, after getting out of the hospital and staying with them. I just can't leave him. Uh, There's something, you know, I just can't leave him. So at the man. very least, she signed off half of her life insurance policy to her, to her sister. Mm. And then she ended up dying later because she got, it ended up turning out to be nicotine poisoning. Nicotine but poisoning? But she never smoked. And Paul <laughs> never smoked. It was oh. uh, insane levels of nicotine. <laughs> and she had Ambien because he would make all these exotic salad dressings for her mm. he would he would draw her bath for her mm. he would do everything for her so you go well i kind of figure the ambient the the coroner is going i see ambien which is not normal and insane levels of nicotine which mm. is also for a person who's not smoking kind of red flag this is now a homicide wow. so the cops get involved the problem is there's no evidence that he did anything they, they found a slight puncture wound from a sir from a syringe in the back of her ear mm. Mm. So there's, but again, they never found the syringe. They never found the Ambien. They never found the nicotine. Hmm. So Paul got away. Wow. What, sh- wouldn't there be something more efficient than nicotine, just like some arsenic or well, ricin or something? I don't, I don't want to like think <laughs> like a killer, but you would think that if a, if a autopsy reveals nicotine, they might just dismiss that as saying, well, maybe she yes. was a smoker. So that doesn't seem to be. You know, right, right. The, a a smoking gun per se. Right, right. And they end up arresting him in 1990 because the case went cold. But a new prosecutor, a new detective, came on board and said, "There's something off about this." We interviewed the guy. He had to be the only suspect. There was nobody else. No forced entry. Mm-hmm. Nobody else came to the house or at that time of death. A few hours before, a few hours after, he reported the death, and he was crying. In between, uh, her. Her one, her two hospital stints, both times were because she was getting worse and worse. She even asked a coworker to come live with her for a little bit to see to vet Paul. Oh. And this lady goes, "Okay, I never saw anything wrong. He would draw, her, like I said, draw her bath, make mm-hmm. exotic salads. He would do it's always talk about. It. It's like I, I, I can't see it. I can't see the, mm-hmm. the crazy guy. But so this is all this. None of this helped poor Linda, who ended up getting murdered. And then in 1994, mm-hmm. they finally convicted him. Wow, they did convict him. Yeah, wow. they did. They they arrested. They did convict him. He's still he's appealing the decision. He got life. He got life in prison, because they they ran the evidence. A, a, a sergeant and a and a and a DA. The sergeant basically wanted to interview him again. He had gotten remarried, and living in another state, collecting still collecting life insurance from Linda's uh, policy. Wow. So this is the the Jeopardy champion. This is the Jeopardy champion. So at what point in all this did he appear on Jeopardy? Before. Before so he it was prior, yeah, prior to, to that, because oh, wow. that, okay. that's what he used. Like, hey, I'm a two-time Jeopardy champion, mm. oh, okay. and you know, I, I'm part of Mensa. And people are like, yeah, two-time Jeopardy champion, yeah, okay, but mm. Mensa, I don't know if any of this fits. And he come across like one of those fake, you know, fake smart people. Yeah. The, the more and more we talk to you, but it's just that. So this guy, you, if you ever find this episode, and it's from sure that they're like, oh, there's a guy who's a, a cold, calculated killer. What wow. what year was he on? 1989. 89? Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you can so figure a young Alex Trebek going, okay, and here we go. And it's just like, yeah, there's this guy right there. The mind of a serial killer. I thought that was bad enough. So 
at least they caught this guy. Yeah. And you know, before he killed anyone else, you know, he's married. He's been married three times. So at this, Linda, I think was the second wife. The 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 story, the case of the dating game serial killer, yeah. serial killer, because it's not just one murder. Yeah. Rodney Akala. This is this falls in right in line <laughs> with Joe talking about. Hey, we're the police in 1978. I guess there's blood over here, but nothing to see. I, like I said, I don't like to armchair quarterback because it's easy to say that when you don't have proper DNA evidence and, right. and the benefit of computers and technology. But they did catch serial killers back then. Yes. They still caught murderers back then with good old-fashioned inve- investigations. And, sure. And they were... So Rodney Akulla was born in Texas, 1943, came from a good home, had a mom, had a good, good home, had siblings. Who went to West Point. He went to the military. Oh, oh, by the way, Paul Curry was also in the military. I'm not indicting the military. <laughs> just saying it was weird when I was looking at him. I'm like, oh, you both served in the military. How mm-hmm. weird. He got discharged from the military. Honorably discharged. Even though they said, hey, I think there might be something, you know, off with him. You know, with his psychological profile. So, no red flag. They, they just didn't mark it. They said, hey, honorable discharge. So, he can go on and still apply for jobs and whatever. He gets out. And in 19, I want to say 68, he assaults, I have the, unfortunately, there was, a, I thought I could commit some of these to memory, but no. So he, he assaults a 16-year-old girl outside of an IHOP. Really? And apparently they, they can get enough evidence to convict him or anything. So he's out. This one, in 1968, he's outside the... Uh, Oh, what was the name of the hotel, Joe? The Charlotte House? The what? No. It's called the Charlotte House? No, not the Charlotte. Um, it's in it's in L.A. It's a famous hotel. Starts with C. The Chateau? Was, Chateau. Oh, Thank the you. Chateau, Chateau Mar- 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 Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Getting late, folks. So wow. that's, that's my brain. But yeah. So this family is staying there because their house had, had to go some renovation because of an of a, of a accident, a fire accident. Their eight-year-old daughter, Tally Shapiro. Going to school looks like almost like something out of a central casting, as you think an innocent girl with pigtails. The, Rodney Akala's car comes up, and he basically is trolling. He's like, "Hey, would you? I have these pictures. Uh, would you like to come in?" And she's like, "Oh, my mom and dad told me never to talk to strangers." He says, "I know your mom and dad." She says, "I was taught to respect my elders." She gets in the car. <laughs> a bystander sees something, say something, happens to see it, tails the guy back to the apartment, calls the cops because he sees. Eight year old get in, wow. and she she says I knew something was wrong because he said oh instead of going to see your mom and dad we have to stop off at my apartment. Cops come in, Ugh. knock on the door. You hear a lot of scrambling inside. The guy opens the you know he he's basically naked or he says I was in the shower but he's like he wasn't wet. Mm. So the cop breaks down the door, finds all this blood on there. The eight year old girl's lying on the ground, clothes off, and has a metal bar across her neck. Oh my god! Cop has to make a decision: Do I go after the guy or stay? In, provide life-saving he yeah. saves the he saves the girl wow but because when he called for help the cop who's covering the back door came thought there was something wrong so that's how rodney Akala got away oh no at the oh. time so they put her on an apb to go search for him so <clears throat> what happens then he flees to new york and takes on the name of john Berger. <laughs> and so as john Berger, he ends up killing you know he, and he has a certain type he looks for Women with you know, and he and he gets to New York like around 1971, and uh, this is when he starts. Uh, there's a young lady named Cornelia Criley. She's a stewardess, and uh, at the time, people who lived as, as stewardess they were considered ambassadors in the sky. And along there's a part of New York where it's called Girl Belt, because all the young young women were staying at that time. Mm. So the blackout hits. And this went right when there's a lot of crime going on. And apparently there's around 2,000 murders a year happening in New York at this time. This is about 19, um, say, 71. Yeah. And so when she doesn't show up, they, they go to find her. Her body is, I mean, they find the blood. and They find the body. She was raped and, and you know, mm. murdered. And they don't have any evidence on John Berger. Turns out he ends up going to New Hampshire because there's a summer summer camp there where he would spend the summers as a looking over a camp counselor. Couple rainy night happens, a couple of campers go to the post office to seek shelter. They see the FBI's ten most wanted on there because 
Rodney Akala's on there. And they go, hey, that looks like Mr. Berger. Oh. They call the camp counselor. The counselor says, don't say, doesn't say anything. Comes over there, looks at it, calls the FBI. If it calls LA, says, we got your guy. He's over here. Mm. They fly over. They catch him. They bring him back for the Tally Shapiro, the eight-year-old thing. Has nothing to do with the, the Crowley because they don't know about that because mm. no one's taking, no one is connected yet. Her Tally's family keeps her in, moved to Mexico because they said when she got out of the hospital because she survived. Everyone was looking at her as this victim. She didn't want to handle all that. So the family says, I don't want my you know, father said, I don't want my daughter to deal with this. Takes her to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico to ra- raise and live there. When the trial happens, they don't. the girl doesn't come back. So it's supposed to be kidnapping, rape, molestation, and assault, attempted murder, or molestation. Well, they drop everything. They, I think they drop most of the charges because the victim's not there to testify. Mm. Oh. So he gets a defer a, an in, an indeterminate sentence, one year to life. So he goes to prison, and then within thirty uh, thirty four months, he's released because he goes through because he's he, they say he's a sociopath. He's very charming. Goes yeah. through the the mental health, and they say, yeah, you know what? He's on parole. He's good to go. They release him. He's out in California right now, and he's in UCLA, and he, and that's when he ends up. Uh, I think there was someone that he was tracking, and then there was another murder. Gosh! And he they ends up had him. They had him. They had and him. They let him go. This is a story about him being ha- multiple times because he ends mm. up. There's a murder that ha- that happens in California. He flees to New York again, and murders another a socialite named Helen Hover. Gosh! Her dad used to run a, a club called um, Carol. Uh, for it starts with the C because that's this is where uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin would come this club <laughs> so he goes over there and he ends up murdering her and she the only reason they were able to connect rodney cullen and john Berger because she writes on a calendar i'm here to meet i'm going to meet john Berger. Mm. so when she goes missing he moves back to california and they finally say they finally uh, you know come and ask him like hey uh what oh yeah we i end up hanging out with her but i didn't see her that night because i don't know and they never had a body to uh, to find anything, it mm. turns out a few months later they find the body. There's no evidence, and so this goes on and on. He, after all this, money he has not ended up on the dating game show yet. <laughs> he he ends up getting a job at the L.A. Times where he gets to put the the blocks in for the paper. For anyone who doesn't know, back in the day, you had to it called a typesetter. Yeah, the typesetter. You had to put in all the things for all the uh, uh, the words that we see on the front page. Yeah. And he would have pictures of new, naked pictures of, of women and boys, and people in L.A. thought, "Oh, yeah, he's just kind of eccentric. Maybe that's he's just an artist." They didn't automatically think pedophile. Yeah. But he, he had him there at work. Yeah, he would show he would show people at work. Oh. And the L.A. Times never really ran a background check on him. Hmm. Oh. Because they're saying, "How would you not know Rodney Keller and John Berger? Yeah. Like, which name are you putting on there? Both have Rodney Keller definitely has a as a case. Hmm. So." Uh, the, the the long story short, because I know we're, we we can't keep going on on this, he ends up on the dating game in 1978. He ends up winning. Imagine being the two guys that lost to the, <laughs> to the serial. To, but killer. again, he's a charmer. Yeah. yeah. So the the lady who, who sees him after after the show says, "I'm not going on a date with this guy. He's yeah. giving all sorts of creepy vibes." And what they think is that might have that rejection might have set him off because he ended up killing about three more women after that. Wow. <laughs> up until 1979, he was finally arrested, and there was a. a the murder of a 12-year-old girl named Robin Samso. That's what finally got him mm. put away. And even though they tried, they tried to get him for other cases, they almost lost it because they couldn't get the sexual crimes to stick. Uh. So he ended up dying in 2021 wow. in prison. But this was the dating game serial killer. So at least seven, <clears throat> if not eight women, dead. Uh, a 16, 8, and 12-year-old sexually assaulted yeah after they had him in custody and let him go after that and his mo was he would put them in strange like they found some of the women some of the victims they they even had open casket the faces were messed up yeah they find bite marks on the breasts yeah. it's just like a true animal yeah you know what's weird is i had never heard this story until maybe just a few weeks ago and uh I was what I was googling online was celebrities who had appeared on the dating game, 
And that roster includes Farrah Fawcett, Suzanne Summers, oh Yvonne Craig, who played Batgirl, Lindsay Wagner, the Bionic Woman, Leif Garrett, the singer, uh, Tom Selleck, and Lee Majors. And as I'm looking at the list, it's, it, then it said, and there was a serial killer. And I was like, <laughs> what? And I didn't do the deep dive that you did, but uh, imagine that. Imagine, And you, well, could, you could find that, that yeah. clip online. This is just a surface story. I, I encourage people to go look it up because... And look, it, Joe just read a list of, of celebrities who ended up on the dating game before they were celebrities, probably. Yeah. Vanna White was a contestant on The Price is Right before she became yeah. Vanna White of Wheel of Fortune fame. Yeah. One of my favorite uh, dating game contestants that, for some reason, wasn't on that list I just read was Pee Wee Herman. Imagine <laughs> three women lined up, and they are introduced to The Bachelor, and he's like, I know you are, but what am I? It's like, what the hell is going on? He was, he was like <laughs> as Pee Wee Herman as a contestant. That is his story. But you know, with this I, Rod, with I this there's footage of that on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, you can find okay, that online. Good, yeah. I the, didn't know that. The other bachelors that lost to Rodney Acolor were saying, yeah, this guy kind of gave up a creep vibe. I'm like, and you still lost to this guy. Yeah. That's how, you know, that's how these serial killers like Ted Bundy and uh, what was the other guy, Dahmer. Like, one thing that pissed me off, they, they, there were these documentaries on these serial killers and, and and the Ted Bundy one was just a few years ago. And I, I got really creeped out because on social media and Twitter, women were posting, you know, he was kind of hot. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, you're watching a documentary about a serial killer. And you're like, he was kind of hot. And that's how these guys operate. Yeah, you, they do something to these women. These are the, these are the comments of a future victim. Yeah. I mean, and here's the thing between, Unfortunately, I think only Joe was uh, here for this part because I was born in 79. But 77 to 78, it was like the, 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 that year or two of serial killers. Yeah. It was like, you know, the dating game serial killer, the Summer of Sam. Oh, sure. I mean, it just. It, Zo- what was the Zodiac, Zodiac killer? killer? Was that yeah. the 80s? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was just like all these different types. T- yeah. Bundy. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, and so on the news, you were just going, my God, is nobody safe? Yeah. <laughs> Gacy, another one. Yeah, you're sitting in there probably in Kansas going, that's why the cities are dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But these guys just get away f- with it for so long and they think they're. Uh, but they brought know. that up in the doc. Like, how did no- How did the LA Times. Yeah. It's not early Rodney Acala. This is after I've done some pretty violent stuff, Rodney Acala, some pretty gruesome stuff. It just works with the LA Times. It's not even like a mom and pop paper. It's the LA Times. Yeah. 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 But you, you, me- you mentioned that women were saying Dahmer and. The other guy were hot, but the other day I had to ask myself, is, is Casey Anthony single? You know, she was kind of cute. The lady who killed her daughter. Yeah. My uh, God, Andrew. I, that was just for you. <laughs> My God, man. I see a calendar in your future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hot serial killer calendar. Uh, we're getting close to an hour, but I'm going to call an audible, and we're going to keep going because Andrew has not introduced his topic. Yeah, yet, I, so. I don't have a whole lot, but uh, guys might have heard uh, in the 1950s there was some scandals on some quiz shows. Oh, yeah. Uh, that basically had the producers coaching the contestants by feeding them scripts of, of how to answer. And in one case, um, for a show called 21... Um, there was a guy who had won several episodes in a row and they felt like the show was getting stale and the show wasn't very high in the ratings. So they decided to pick a selected contestant who had a, a, a decent, uh, family background and who, uh, had a, had a wealthy name, I guess. Uh, and they told him, or they told the guy who had been winning, Hey, you need to take the fall and you need to you know, loose to this guy. Mm. And uh, the guy was complicit in it. But uh, later on, some investigative reporters for, I believe it was oh, Time Magazine, um, did a cover, or did a, did a story and asked, are these, are these shows uh, 100% real or is there some fixing going on? So that led to investigations and people admitting, yeah, we, we were coached. Yeah. You know what's and, interesting about that is – the producers, when they got together and, and discussed fixing these shows, there were no laws on the books that dictated that you can or can't cheat on television game shows. Right. And so they they took that as a green light. Yeah, it was a new medium, right? TV it's was entertainment. Very new at the yeah, time. Right. We and, can script it if we want. And uh, I forgot the name of the law that 
that they were just going by, but it was obviously the law was meant for radio because it, it was enacted like in the mid thirties, obviously before television. And so just like uh, today with the internet and now with artificial intelligence, they were trying to think, okay, how can we limit uh, cheating and, and greed or whatever as a motivating factor for this new medium? And so they had to enact, uh, I forgot the name of the law, but um, Eisenhower signed it into law uh, mm. in his last year of office in 1960. And, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it uh, prompted Robert Redford to uh, produce a movie in uh, the mid-90s called Quiz Show Yeah, that tells the story of of the 21 show. Uh, I haven't seen it. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Nick? No, no. Comment? I am no longer surprised about any of this. <laughs> Andrew, I mean, we've... Uh, I remember as a kid, though, when it came out, I, I it was nine or ten when it came out. I remember my dad saying, oh, yeah, I remember hearing about this when I was young. Yeah. And he bri- I remember he briefly told me about it, and that's my only connection to that movie. But um, I sort of forgot about this until recently uh, when uh, Joe had mentioned the topic. So I thought it was very interesting to look into. And it ended, there ended up being uh, – six or seven shows that ended up being canceled because yeah. uh, the studio heads, they couldn't guarantee that there was no shenanigans going on there. And I think it was a case of, okay, only three or four of these shows got caught. It was probably happening more often. Well, they, after, after those became public, uh, kind of the hammer fell on yeah. quiz shows and people lost their jobs and everything was reevaluated. And then, they started making sure that moving forward that they, you know, they can prevent this from happening. almost a decade, happening. quiz shows, like game shows, kind of went into the dark, in, into the wilderness. And yeah. it wasn't until, like, the early 70s they started to do yeah. their comeback. And but. they had to make way for all those good sitcoms of the 60s, though. That's right. For, for, for prime time. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? Um, Following the quiz show scandals, you know, you think you cover all your bases, but there's there are still a couple of really fascinating stories that happen in relatively modern times within the last few decades. One of them that comes to mind was uh, the quiz show uh, Press Your Luck. And a guy who had watched the show at home was obsessive with it. He started detecting patterns in yep. the light board. And, and for those of you who don't know it by its name, that it's famous for its phrase, no whammies, no whammies, no whammies, stop. Yeah. And so this guy had detected this pattern, became a contestant on the show. And when a, when a certain light bulb would go off, he detected a pattern where a big prize would light up. And so he would keep his eye on that light bulb and he would have his hand over the stop button. And when that light bulb would come on, he'd hit it and it would stop on the money prize. And he did it over and over and over again. So there wasn't necessarily any collusion involved in here, but they were like, this guy can't be that lucky. And eventually they confronted him and he admitted to it. And I don't know if he took home his winnings or not. He did. Uh, he did keep his $100, winnings. $100,000. Yeah. Only pro- karma caught up to him, though. Uh, what happened? He ended up killing someone? No, no, no. <laughs> he ended up losing about 50. Someone stole 50 grand from his house, and then he oh, ended geez. up losing the other 50 grand through bad investments. Oh, stuff, wow. So Yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting case because it was a flaw in the system. It's a, it was a flaw in the electronics, and he exploited that flaw. So, in a sense, he was cheating, but it wasn't necessarily his fault. I, you know, I remember thinking when I was a kid, uh, I, I used to play Atari a lot, and I played Space Invaders and Asteroids and stuff like that. And I would play the, the game for so long, like hours on end, that I started to detect patterns yeah. in the Atari games that allowed you to play for eternity. So, <laughs> like, uh, who's, who's... That's not... That's not you know what? You put the work in. You had to play for hours. So yeah. you, it's That's hours you weren't spent getting ice cream, hanging out with friends, <laughs> reading a book, something probably that normally... You know, that most parents would be like, I can't believe Joe, you went down that rap. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, along those lines, uh, the price is right. Someone did the same thing, too. One guy knew the pa- the price of every item yeah. on there. And when Drew Carey first took over, just I think the first year after Bob Barker, yeah. and a, a contestant who knew the guy in the audience because he was listening to the guy, looked to him at, final, uh, at the final bid and got it to the exact dollar. Wow. Drew yeah, Carey. The showcase sh- yeah. <laughs> yeah, the showcase. Yeah, the showcase showed. Drew Carey read the, he said the exact price. That's a perfect match. <laughs> Drew Carey looked like, Am I, are we about to get black bagged here? Like, what's about to happen? Yeah, they had to, 
because nor- I, I sat in the audience for uh, The Price is Right when Bob Barker was hosting, and they basically went through it as if it was live. And they would, you know, obviously go to commercial breaks, and Bob would interact with the audience stuff. But on that particular episode, which a documentary was made about this, yeah. I think it was called The Perfect Bid or something. Yeah. And they had to stop, and, and Drew Carey met with his producer and and he's like, what's going on? And they said, he guessed exactly right to, to the dollar. And they're like, what do we do? And they didn't know how to handle it. And so, again, it wasn't necessarily a case of cheating. It was a guy who knew the show so well that – now, if I remember correctly, the contestant who bid was, pre- was listen, looking, looking at, him. at the person who was giving him hand signals. Yeah, the guy, so. the guy who knew the exact prize would never get called up. I think he only got called up once in his life because <laughs> he would go every time trying to get called up. He would never do because he can't control that part. But then he would help people. He'd say, "Hey, it's six hundred seventeen dollars for that for that typewriter." Yeah. And people like at some point, people just looking back, this guy, this guy knows all the numbers. He's a savant. So that guy who makes it to the show final showcase looks at the guy and he says, and "He's going by the numbers." And he says, "The Drew cares of who is he looking at?" I'm like, oh my god! But yeah, but that's. Is that cheating? I I wouldn't call it cheating. Yeah. I mean, if anything, the guy might have been on the spectrum, you know, like Rain Man who, you know, he'd throw matchsticks or toothpicks on the floor and go, there's 386. He created a spreadsheet over it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, yeah, is it cheating? I I, I don't remember what the outcome of that was, but. They had to like try and put things in place to keep that from happening again because they're yeah. like they were afraid that it was going to be like the quiz show scandals all over again. Um, pretty crazy. Um, there's a guy I wanted to bring up. Uh, someone told me just fairly recently. There's a guy on Facebook. His name is Randy West, and um, if you're interested in these kind of stories, follow Randy West on Facebook. He is a longtime announcer in Hollywood. Okay. Uh, would do warm up for crowds. He worked on like every game show with with uh, you know famous announcers like uh, Rod Wrighty on The Price Is Right and and all those guys. And he shares his stories on Facebook. And he he wrote a book, um, something like stories from behind the curtain of television or something. But he's a fascinating follow, and he's he's interactive. Like if you comment or or uh, or post something on his page, he'll respond to it and interact with you. And um, but yeah, you can hear some really fascinating stories. And he talks about the quiz so show. So what you're saying, Joe, is potential guest <laughs> that would be that amazing oh i would love to get him to, to the phone in yeah. yeah as a matter of fact just recently i uh i saw a clip from the price is right there's all kinds of great clips from the price is right and there was one when uh bob barker was hosting where they were taking the bids from contestants row down there and they show the prize and like the first contestant bids you know 320 dollars or something and the other guy goes he says something like one thousand two hundred eighty three dollars bob and Bob goes, well, you were pretty confident in that bid. Uh, what's what's behind your confidence? And he goes, I was watching the show last week, and you had the exact same prize, and that was the price. <laughs> so the other contestants bid, knowing they didn't have a prayer. And then that bell goes off, ding, 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 ding the exact price. And they're like, oh, I wonder who won. And that guy had gotten it right. And he wasn't cheating. He but he just copped to it. Yeah, he, he said. He look. watched the episode the week before, and it had the exact same prize on there. <laughs> so, it, eh. The producer's probably sitting in my most guys. We need to be, get better at this. <laughs> yeah. what, what, so. Early last year, I don't know if you guys heard this when it happened, but um, Wheel of Fortune, on Wheel of Fortune, there were three $100,000 wins in a row. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. So that prompted people to, you know, people were calling out Wheel of Fortune, like, are they doing this just to get ratings? Right. And Pat Sajak had to go to Twitter and said, uh, thank you for – the interest in the show, but we would rather not, you know, get felonies and you know, <laughs> yeah. it's illegal since such and such. And he yeah. went through the whole thing. He's not going to end his tenure <laughs> on a massive scandal. That is, I mean, that is a, it's a, uh, I don't know what the mathematical odds of that happening are of, of three $100,000 wins in a row. Yeah. But I can't imagine that they, they would risk fixing yeah, you know, and there's there's been I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but over the last year or two, there's been a lot of stories that have made the news that involve Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, where weird things have been happening on the set. Pat Sajak, um, what was it? Someone accused Pat Sajak of like misleading a contestant yeah, or something. Yeah. And there was something just recently on uh, on Jeopardy. Um, or no, let me go back to Wheel of Fortune. So 
the category for a puzzle on Wheel of Fortune was something like fun and games. And that was like the, you know, the clue or whatever. And so the contestants are trying to guess it. It might have been the final Wheel of Fortune puzzle. Sure. And the contestant couldn't guess it. And the answer involved jogging. It had something to do with jogging. Yeah. And and people on Twitter and stuff said, how is jogging, how does that fall under the fun and games category? Oh, like, that's, that's only that's in the run. That's very no, misleading. They're, they're a runner. That's a producer who is a running enthusiast. <laughs> yes. like, I get that runner's high. I'm like, yeah, you and five yeah. others on the planet. Yeah, no, jogging is not fun. And, uh, and yeah, and so there's been Jeopardy ones too where like, categories have been a little misleading and they kind of throw off her or maybe the contestant doesn't state the clue exactly correctly and they lose out and it's like come on it, man it, it seems like there are a couple times in final jeopardy where somebody like if they misspell the final word like by one or two letters they'll say oh a technicality we can't accept that yeah and there have been a couple times where i'm like Come on. It's also the, it's also the mispronunciation. Sometimes they'll get it, like, yeah, if it's yeah. close. They should give it to you. Yes. I think what I think I saw a clip of someone, uh, an Asian gentleman, was saying uh, it was um, Gary. That it was, but it ended up being someone was named for gerrymandering. But we call it gerrymandering. Oh in public, yeah, yeah. But his actual name was pronounced his last name was pronounced Gary. Yeah. Or so Alex had to kind of correct him. Uh, and the guy was like, "It's called gerrymandering." He's like, "Yeah, that's kind of one of those things about the English language." So people are like, "Ooh, yeah, yeah." And that's why oftentimes when they'll come back from break, the host will say, uh, we, "We have a a, a, <laughs> cor- a a correction to make to be uh, according to our judges." Right. So they do have that system in place. Yeah. So you you can't fault them too much. Well, just about every game show at the very end or in the credits, it'll say something like. Uh, Edits have been made to this program oh, that yeah. don't necessarily affect the outcome got, of the game. You have to do but the But sometimes they got to, yeah, they got to kind of fix things. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they yeah. kind of do this stuff like, like, what was the UK? Who wants to be a millionaire? There's someone coughing the audience uh, to show that when you were going to pick the right answer. Oh. <laughs> and so they were like. Interesting. It, 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 it took someone who was probably working at a casino because the casinos will catch everything. I have a cousin who, who's, who lives in Vegas. He tells me casino security is. It, it would surprise me if they have AI back there. Oh sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad we 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 ended up on a, on a what I would like to call a scandalous light note compared to the early <laughs> murders and serial killing that we're talking about. Yeah, so. and on a lighter note, yeah. So that is uh, our episode. Don't touch that dial. Uh, dedicated to television murders, crimes, and scandals. Thank you guys for joining me. That was a fun one. And thanks uh, for having us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a brand new episode. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you next time on Hollywood Crime Scene. Good night, everybody.